good evening welcome to everybody welcome to katha karwan's women's day special the amazing movie yes we women are always amazing and you know in our lives we are constantly inspired and admired you know by everybody around us and in turn we also get inspiration and admiration you know we also admire many other people around us could be our mamas our grandmothers or even you know uh, like you know our maids the laundry woman who comes all the way or you know from far of distance to pick up the clothes it could be you know the maid who holds a smile you know working in many houses over there and an 80 year old woman who just goes through the streets selling milk packets these people energize us inspire us motivate us they might not be having you know hordes of prizes ladders of prizes and certificates but they actually know the true value of life the true essence of life and why do these stories or the experiences of these women inspire us because they have the elements of truth facts beliefs and value systems and so katha karwan is here today to share with all of you such amazing moments such wonderful moments probably moments that made us happy probably moments that let us down probably moments that have enabled us to transform or learn something from that experience from that situation So here comes Preeti Warrior as a first teller for today's evening. Preeti Warrior is a professor in a engineering college. She is an amazing writer, and all her stories reflect the realities of life. Somewhere or the other, we can connect with them. And she also has won many awards and prizes for her writings on many online platforms. So Preeti, ready to share? Hi, you can hear me, uh, Rohini, properly? Yes, yes, Preeti. Yeah. yeah so the title of my story is my maid of honor and it is about my domestic help her name is mallika and she has been with us for the past 35 years now i mean it was, i was 8 when we moved to mumbai and since then she has been the domestic help at our place and i guess at that time she was you know carrying her second child or something i very well remember so mallika as you say as a person she is somebody whom you know we earlier we used to call initially all of us used to call her khadus that's what that's the word in hindi khadus means a person who's very you know what do you say doesn't talk to anyone like that but then now i mean through the years i've been realizing that it's because she does not gossip she does not you know kind of talk to one person about another household or anything like that she does not waste time on loose talk she's that good and though that sincere you could say she comes she works and she goes and that's the reason why i guess there are so many people who employ her very straight forward and a person you could say who is very soft on the inside hard outside of course you would feel that she is very uh, strict in that way but that otherwise we know i mean through the years we have got to know that she is a very soft person inside a very caring person so now you know after all these years she has started opening up to my mother she works in both households mine also and my mother's also but then i go to work and i don't get much time to interact with her but with my mother she has been interacting a lot now so i know her story so malika came to you know mumbai at a very young age i guess from tamil nadu from some village in tamil nadu and uh, when she came here she has been staying in the slums in tombe that's what it is called as so her husband is a good boss i would say he's no more he was a good man that way he never used to abuse her or there was no drinking problem or anything else sir but he would never stay in one job he would always change shift jobs and it was a problem financially they were facing lots of problems and then the kids arrived so this woman mallika kind of decided that like many other ladies near her she would also start going to you know work as a domestic help though her husband did not encourage her much but then she started going and then you know kind of the financial things improved she stood uh, straight to her point that is i have to work because of the fact that she is illiterate so she did not want her children to be literate that's the first thing she she was sure that her children should be graduates they should be literate whatever happens so malika now has two sons and a daughter the third one is a daughter and she was malika why i like her so much is that i mean uh, you know despite all those problems that they face that ladkiyon ko mat padhao why should girls study so much her daughter is a bcom first class holder and she made sure that the girl studies and whatever happens you know as soon as this girl finished her graduation there were many marriage proposals she would tell my mother that now people have started contacting because she is a graduate a good looking talented girl but malika stood her ground that no she would not get married unless she finds a job and this girl did find a job as an accountant that still she is working 
so my maid though she was illiterate and though she was work, she is still working as a domestic help you know she was very plain very sure about the fact that her daughter would be educated and will go to work that was always there her second son also you know is a graduate again and that boy he had a love marriage she would say and then as usual there were some slight squabbles between the mother in law and daughter in law that always happens somehow and then but malika very strongly advised her son to go somewhere else and stay and she did not migrate or shift with them she was very sure about the fact that let the couple young couple have a life of their own somewhere close by so that they could help her whenever required but then the squabbles and all should not be there she was never that kind of a mother in law who would say that my daughter in law should sit at home and do household work that girl also is working both of them are pretty well educated and are having their own life Malika's daughter also got married. I mean, we knew I had gone for that marriage, and to a good boy. But then again, the same thing. Her in-laws, the girls' in-laws, had a problem with her working. And when she had her first delivery, the in-laws suddenly said, "You know, she should not work. Who will help us at home?" And now she has a kid also, who will look after the kid. I was so surprised when Malika one day told my mother that I am least bothered if she even leaves her husband and comes back home. I will take care of the grandchild and my daughter. She has a good job. I am working. but i cannot allow someone okay, else to you know kind of uh, just check your mic now hello you are not able to hear anything rohini no not audible uh okay hello is it audible now hello no from the beginning it was not audible rohini i'm so sorry no, you are not audible well, look, from the beginning it was there just in, just few seconds back it got your uh, voice got now again it is audible now it is proper no or else you remove your head, uh, headphones and just see hello now it is proper rohini now it is proper now proper not able to hear you yes now okay yes, yes are you able to hear me yes yes yeah yes. so till where did you hear <laughs> just so, a few 10 seconds before, uh, before you know uh, you're talking okay. about her daughter in law Uh, yeah so what i was saying is malika my maid she is very she was very particular that her daughter works so even after the marriage you are able to hear me right yeah so even after the daughter got married and went to you know her in-laws place and all the in-laws were having a problem with the daughter working and especially when she had a baby the in-laws stopped the girl from working so Malika was very sure that whatever happens, she would take care of the daughter and the granddaughter, but her daughter should go to work and be financially independent. She was very much, you know, particular about that fact that the girl should not suffer because she was educated. She is a BCom first class. So I was very surprised that even at this age, there are parents who, you know, force their daughters to remain married and even endure domestic abuse and all. But Malika was. very clear that my daughter should be independent and she has to take care of herself she should not be leaving her job just because her in-laws are forcing her to so malika kind of has been taking good care of the daughter and the middle son but the eldest son the eldest son has a few drinking problems and stuff like that so that boy used to beat up his wife he got into drinking drugs and stuff so he would beat up his wife and children so malika has been so considerate that she took that daughter in law her eldest daughter in law and the two grandchildren under her own wings she does not you know take in the son she says that boy is not good and unless he stops drinking she would not let him inside the household but her granddaughter grandchildren and her eldest daughter in law are staying with her so she is like very strong she said ki i mean if my son is not behaving properly that's his problem so and i will take care of the daughter in law get her a job somewhere help her with something but no matlab i will see to it that my grandchildren are also getting educated so malika now is taking care of her daughter in law her two grandchildren 
also listening and kind of solving problems with her own daughter with the other household everything but you should see the strength on her face you know she never bows down she never begs for money she even never asks for money she's like hey, i will take care and i don't see a single drop of tear in her eyes she lost her husband midway the entire financial burden is on her now her husband is no more her children uh, the elder son does not you know kind of cooperate her uh, daughter is also having a few marital problems but still in spite of all that she makes sure that you know everything is being taken care of and every day she comes to work without taking a single day of holiday that i have seen hardly ever does she take a leave she comes to work she enjoys working and she works very diligently earns and make sure she is independent as well as all the women she has around her are independent that's why this woman mallika is the strongest woman that i have ever seen thank you that is so profound and uh, so deep uh, priti like uh, i'm just wondering how is it possible i'm just wondering how is it possible only for them even you know uh, when i see my maid you know she has lost her husband when her children both her children were 3 uh, years and you know one and a half year now the doctor she has completed her graduation and she she wants to pursue uh, you know a nursing course in post graduation and her son has come with flying colors in her 10th grade he is doing his inter first year now paying you know thousands of rupees and they are studying in good colleges and she always holds that smile you know as i told in the introduction she always holds that smile despite having so many comforts in life despite having everything in our lives we always fall down you know we feel ki you know i'm not fine i'm not well somewhere or the other we are not well so i i always think that and they laugh so open heartedly whenever they are conversing having conversations with their you know peers and all they laugh with a lot of you know completely from their hearts and such a simple uh, li- kind of living that they have i really admire them thank you for sure. sharing such a wonderful uh, story it is very inspiring and true that thank you roni this not you know a woman a woman we see in the newspapers a woman whom we see on social media you know that she has done this she has done that it is actually the women who are doing such right wonderful there. jobs that we have every to, day yeah every, every day every day even at the fall sick they come to work they tell me ki mam um, 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 didi aaj mere tabiyat thoda theek nahi hai main aapke ghar mein kaam karke chale jaungi then i wonder their grit their determination is amazing true true thank you so much uh, for sharing such a wonderful story priti thank you thank you and you know uh, how beautiful it would be like uh, we sitting with our grandparents and you know sharing our experiences with them or they sharing their experiences with them there is lot of learning unfortunately i always feel whenever a situation like this comes in many events i have told people you know because some of them they would be sharing about their grandmothers like grandfathers they shared this they shared stories with us and that is how we you know we nurtured we harnessed the skill of storytelling and i'm very unfortunate that you know i lost both, both my grandfathers i haven't even seen them Uh, frankly speaking and my grandmothers okay fine but i did not have so much of you know that connection with them but still any woman uh, of that age i see i just go and sit with them and in my community all the senior citizens would love them rather than talking to people of my age i just go sit with them and talk with them that would be really wonderful that gives us lot of happiness lot of contentment and that is how we actually establish you know intra generational or inter generational relationships because you know it is actually speaking it is harnessing and nurturing and nourishing the family structures so let us hear a beautiful experience that would be shared by veena veena ji she is a retired school teacher and she strongly believes that storytelling she carries storytelling to different places she works with ngos she works with schools she always loves to stay with children and share stories all around her using different methodologies different techniques you know kamishi bai has been her latest favorite so let us hear what veena ji has got to say in her basket today veena ji the screen is yours thank you rohini that was a nice introduction and thank you preeti for a great start so my story i name it as building international intergenerational um, bridges 20th march is uh, world storytelling day and um, 
this sort of uh, fits into that bracket too of building bridges. Anandi Ananda Gade Jikade Tikade Sohi Kade. There is fun and joy here and there, everywhere. Well, my story begins with my eye, my mother, who is aged 90. And mostly she is immobilized because she's lying on the bed. But sometimes she does get up for her meals and her uh, bath and things like that. Whenever I visit her, her eyes light up. And she has this bright smile on her face. Tu Alice, far barivatli mala. You come here and you really make my day very strong and very nice. Well, I go to Mumbai to meet my mother, not only to just do the aged care duties, but to also do some cementing work or let those flowers bloom in that bridge between the two of us and connecting each other. And so, I sat down with my cup of chai and sat next to her and touched her wrinkled skin. Ai, how are you? We spoke for the, that day, the next day, the next day. Conversations always remain the same. Days after, months after, maybe a year or two also. How do I make it a little more interesting? So boring to talk to an old lady the whole day, isn't it? Well, the storyteller in me the next day decided to bring out a little puppet. I, are you ready? Her face lit up and she said, Are you going to tell me a story? Yes, I, I will tell you a story about this little girl and that little girl and this grandmother and that grandmother. And so a few moments passed. We had some meaningful talk. We had something nice to exchange rather than the same usual talk. The next day, I know she likes flowers. So I brought her a bunch of flowers from the market. Her face lit up again. Aga, that is the red rose. And that's the red hibiscus. And look at the mango leaves. And they are green. And what are these? And that's the yellow alamander. And she went on up talking about the jasmine. She even remembered her uh, childhood stories of how she used to go into the garden with her father and tend to the garden, catch butterflies maybe. And so our conversations developed the next day too. Day three. Day four, I knew I had to create some special bonds between us, some special memories and some interesting things between us. So I brought out a book to read. The next day, I chanted something with her. Now this, this way, the communication was in fact so enriching for both of us that we shared a lot of old stories, old memories, even food recipes. She suddenly remembered something about how she used to cook and how she used to put uh, colors during Rangoli. So certainly it was beneficial to both of us. Happy moments of communication. Well, I came back home only to hear that a friend of ours aged 80 plus had a fall in her kitchen and was in the hospital. A few friends and me, we went, decided to go and meet her. And Everybody else was asking her, how did you fall? What happened? Are you here, there? She turned around to me and she said, aren't you going to tell a story? Why don't you bring your smile and some stories to the hospital? People will benefit instead of just staring at these sick people and not knowing what to do and what to talk. Well, that was a good thing, isn't it? That we were building some more bridges of communication. But one day, I fractured my wrist and I sat in the balcony every evening. I couldn't go for a walk. My hand used to get tired and I was also tired. I began to get lonely. Six weeks for this chatterbox, Veena, to keep quiet is not easy. Because social communication, social interaction, I think are very fundamental necessities for the humans. 
And so I sat down in my balcony, wondering who will talk to me? How will I uplift my own mood? What should I do? I can't watch the television and read a book the whole day. But just then, some children from the uh, colony called out, Aji, Auntie, come, tell us your stories. Or maybe talk, talk to us at least. Well, they were 10 plus years and I was only 60 plus. There was a wide generation gap. But I love to talk to them because they lifted my mood. I got some positive energy from them. And we spoke about their exams, exam stress, and what activities to do after that. And whether they liked this teacher or they didn't like some teacher. Or oh, maths. Oh, I don't like maths. I like storytelling. And so it continued. Now, these kind of communications actually helped both the generations. They benefited from me, from my stories and cultural values and my cooking tips and whatever. And I found the love and companionship that energized me. And this is the way we built some more bridges. Well, sometimes we reach a bridge. But then should I cross it? Do I know how to cross it? Oh, no. I don't have that capability, the mindset, the emotions. And so for me also, a certain bridge came up quite recently and I did not know what to do. I pondered, I reflected and I said, ah, no, I don't think I can do this. But something inside told me, no, you have to do it. Come on, walk up that bridge, go up, hold it and walk. And so I tried. Well. I had a teaching offer at Kadalore and at Chennai for a few days. Chennai? Tamil? I don't know how to speak Tamil. Very little. Well, you have to walk, walk, walk. So I held the steps of the bridge and I walked. And I decided, no, I am going into the class, presenting myself, doing work professionally and setting an example for the younger generation. College students, third year students, what am I to speak to them other than delivering my lecture? I went the next day dressed in a sari. I thought better to earn some respect and be a little more firm. And so I delivered the lecture. Some of it in Tamil, the broken Tamil, they had a laugh. I had a laugh too. And then I froze. Third year college students, uh, what do I talk to them after the class? How do I engage in some conversation? I didn't know what to say. But that's when I presented a PPT. You know the PowerPoint? Yes, I know how to do it. I've learned it. They were quite interested. Well, that broke the ice. And then we got on to talking about mobile phones, Facebook, Instagram, digital learning. They were faster than me. They taught me a few things. And that's how communication then started. I felt much at ease. I felt much understood. And they also felt that, okay, they can talk to me too. I was beginning to understand their needs, their aspirations, their language. And they were understanding what was my viewpoint and where I came from. It's all different all the time. But one has to cross the bridge if you have to reach your goal. Or one has to cross the bridge if you have to get connected. And I'm sure you all know the story of that carpenter and the two farmers, where one of the farmers had built a fence and he was not talking to his brother. But when things became so difficult, there was a carpenter who was passing by with his bag of tools. And the first thing that he did is broke down that fence. And with his tools, he started building a bridge. And after a few days, he asked this brother to walk up from this side and the other brother to walk up from the other side of the bridge. And then they began talking and talking and getting closer. See, building bridges is easy 
or not easy. It's all upon us. Just then, my granddaughter, aged three years old, called out, Aji, let's run in the garden. <sighs> Do I have to run now for a three-year-old? Well, there are other bridges too. A bridge of love, a bridge of companionship. And that's how I keep talking about my intergenerational bridges. Thank you. That is so sweet. Really loved your story. And in fact, it connected with all of us. In fact, it connected with all of us. I want to be now silent for a few seconds, but I cannot be <laughs> staying in the moment. And um, Veena Ji, and you know, the story which you shared at the end, I really loved the story of, you know, connecting the bridges. And I happened to share, this was my first story I shared on uh, Atapath's uh, Storytellers Association. And when you were mentioning about, you know, we have to walk, we have to walk, hold the fence and walk and move forward, connect, bridge yourselves. That where the element of, you know, fear comes in. Most of us or many of us, you know, at many points in time are afraid of doing many things. We take a step back, probably because of imagining something would be wrong, something goes wrong, something might hurt us, something might harm us. So, and I always say constantly, fear has been my best companion. Probably because I made fear as my friend rather than making it as my enemy and battling with it continuously. The only thing which I have observed why fear crops in anybody's mind is simply that it wants to keep us in a safer zone. So it is very much concerned about us. So when you consider fear as your friend, you harness it, it is going to become your strength. It is going to become your courage. And so here we have a wonderful story by Lalita Tilak. Lalita Tilak loves children and she loves sharing stories with children. She always believes that children's physical and emotional well-being will be nurtured and harnessed and nourished through storytelling. So Lalita, good luck to listen to you. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to, <laughs> yes. Hi, good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Um, is my audio clear? Yes, Lalita, you are clear. Am I audible, Rohini? Yes, yes, you are audible. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Rohini, for introducing me. And uh, today I would like to share a story which I have titled and written, and it is called From Fear to Courage. It is a very personal experience story and the, the experience that has really transformed me. So let me get straight into the story. Amma, I know you can do it, Amma. Remember, Amma, when I was in fourth standard, my tennis sir used to hug me from behind and touch me inappropriately. I didn't realize I was uncomfortable, Amma, but you, you noticed it, Amma, and you told me what was good touch, bad touch. And from that day onwards, Amma, I had a sense of what is comfortable and what is wrong. Today, I know, Amma, what is happening is not right. And Amma, I want you to solve this problem for me. When my daughters were in third standard and first standard, I started taking them to the nearby tennis park near my house. Now they started tennis classes and the park became a second home for the next seven years. Evenings were a time we always looked forward to. They used to return from school, quickly freshen up and all three of us used to dash to the park where our extended family was there, of course, the older aunties group, the younger aunties group, my group, the children's group, the walking uncles and aunties, the chatting, the fun times. Oh yes, we really enjoyed going to the park. As the years went by, it was not possible for me to accompany them every day, but the girls used to go all by themselves. That was totally fine because after all, the park was a safe space. Now years passed by, my daughter was in 10th grade and one day she noticed that in the park there was this boy who used to sit on the bench 
and constantly stare at her. Of course, you get to know, right, when somebody is staring at you, when she finishes class, when she was walking around with her friends, she observed that this boy was there every day and he was staring at her. Now, she didn't bother because, um, of course, she, uh, she wanted to ignore and she didn't make a big issue out of it. But yes, when she missed tennis classes for three days and when she went to the park on the fourth day, her friend came up to her and said, Hey, you know, that boy Tiru, he was missing you. He asked where you were. My daughter was shocked. She's like, who? Tiru? Are your admirer who sits on the bench and who stares at you. Oh, my daughter was surprised, but she did not take it seriously and she just left it and she ignored it. My daughters have a habit of coming and telling me everything. So that evening they came back home and they told me, Amma, Amma, this is what happened. And I also told, okay, as long as it's safe, you're in the safe space, as long as he's not bothering you, don't just ignore. And of course, he all, for after all, he might be just a secret admirer, you know, an innocent admirer. So just leave it. Now days passed by. Slowly, my daughter came up to me and started narrating incident after incident. One day, she used to come and tell me, Amma, you know, when we were in the chat shop, that boy was there, Amma. Amma, you know, today, he followed us, Ma. He knows our street. He knows our house. Then another day, she said, Amma, you won't believe it. In front of my school gate, I saw him, Amma. Amma, I'm scared, Amma. And now even I was very scared. You know, all this is just new for me. We see it in movies, we read it in papers, but when it comes to our daughter, obviously we get scared. I was very scared, but still I told her, okay, okay, you be safe. Always be in a safe place where there are people around you. And as long as he's not approaching you or talking to you, it's okay. Be safe. That's what I told her. Now, a few days passed and again she came and told me, Amma, I have to tell you this. Now, my daughter was in 10th grade preparing for her board exams. And her room had a balcony that was facing the road. So she told me, Amma, I study late in the night, Amma. And every night between 10.30 and 11, I hear a cycle going by the road. And the bell constantly ringing, ring, 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 ring. Amma, it is the same boy, Amma. He's coming. And sometimes he just parks the cycle right in front of the balcony. He speaks to his friend in the mobile and he says, I'm not going to leave till I see her. All that stuff, Amma. Amma, I'm just, you know, I'm not at all comfortable. I'm very scared, Amma, and I'm not able to focus. Now, before I could say anything, she said, Amma, you know, I tried ignoring Ma. I ignored for one day, two days, but it's happening, Amma. And Amma, I want you to solve this for me. Now, you all might be wondering, where is the father, right? Okay, my husband, he's a very loving and responsible father. But somewhere, my daughter knew that if this went to her dad, things would go in a very different manner. He might take an extreme step. And even I felt that a huge scene need not be created. Moreover, my in-laws were there, her grandparents, her father. And what she feared the most was they would become very overprotective and stop her from going all by herself to the park. She dreaded that, losing her freedom. Her main stress buster and moments of joy between her studies was she was able to cycle or walk to the park by herself to see the known people and come back. And she dreaded it being stopped by the household. So the responsibility was on me. As a mother, of course, it's my responsibility. My daughter trusted me so much and said, I have to solve. It was my responsibility to see that my daughter felt safe and comfortable. But do you all think I went in action, get set mode? Of course not. I was totally scared. I was very, very nervous and scared because I didn't know how to approach the situation. First of all, I was thinking about, okay, at home, we are hiding this. What will happen if they get to know? On the other side, what spooked me the most was all the news articles which we read, right? The acid attacks, the knife attacks by all these road Romeos. Like when they are confronted, the consequences are always terrible. So I was really nervous because I just didn't know how to do it. What should I do? Should I shout at this boy? Shall I give him a stern warning? Or better, I shall have a very nice, gentle conversation with him. Yes, this is what I decided. Yes, I'm going to go. I'm going to meet that boy. 
I'm going to talk to him very nicely, explain things to him, and basically, you know, even request him to stop troubling my daughter. And in fact, you know, the previous evening, I rehearsed all these lines with my daughter also. She was more than happy that I was taking over the situation and doing something. That's all. So the next day, my daughter and myself, we went to the park. And we were on one side of the park. And on the other side, this boy had come with two of his friends. My daughter pointed out the boy to me and I saw. And at the same time, the boy also saw us. I noticed that he saw us. This boy started walking in one direction. So I, from the other side of the park, started walking in the same direction to meet him. He saw that and he turned and started walking in the opposite direction. So what did I do? I also turned and started walking in the opposite direction. And again, he tried to turn and I became furious. I don't know. I was so angry. This little boy who's talking my daughter, who's scaring her, is now trying to dodge me. Oh no, he is going to get it. And I ran. I ran right in between the park. And, and I ran right in the middle of the badminton court. My friends were shocked were playing badminton. And I caught him near the gate. I questioned him. And it was anything but gentle. I just questioned him. When I saw the fear in his eyes, I got a different courage. And I gave him an ear full. I warned him and I said, you better stay away from my daughter and the street. And if you come anywhere near my street or my daughter, you are going to face it. Oh my God, he was so rattled. And by that time, a crowd of well-wishers gathered around us. And they too gave him a very stern warning. And the boy scooted out of the park. I was shell-shocked. I just sat on the bench and I was like reflecting. What did I plan and how did it turn out to be? And all the well-wishers were surrounding me. And it was very reassuring, their words of comfort. But... My moment of awakening came when my daughter hugged me and said, Amma, you are my hero. I awakened to the fact that I do have the courage within me to face all my fears, all the problems, any situation. And I was reminded of this famous line from an advertisement, Dar ke aage jeet hai. And so most of you all understand, for those who don't know, Darke aage jeet hai means victory always overtakes fear. Thank you. That was a wonderful, I mean, I don't say it is a story and I don't say it is so wonderful or something like that. I should, I, I in fact, resonated, resonated with this story because what you have done just what my mom has done 25 years ago, then when I was in my 10th, I was giving my 10th board exams. I was seeing my mom in you. What you just did, she did that. And uh, the moment I came home, I told my mom, this is what is happening at my examination center. She just came with me, stood with me. And when that boy has come, I told him, I just pointed out, he is the one. She just went and she was so courageous. <laughs> Imagine she's 64 years now and 25 years before the entire era was different. She just took a pen and a paper and noted down his scooter number <laughs> as if she's going to file a complaint with the police. <laughs> she acted so brave and that person, uh, he got scared of what was happening and just turned back and I did not see him ever again in my life. <laughs> and yes, mothers have to be strong. And I learn uh, this kind of aspects much from Shri Karuna because uh, whatever I speak, every time she will have a point. No, Rohini, you should not be like that. No, Rohini, you should not be like that. Don't say that you are managing your child. This is what she always tells me. <laughs> so a wonderful experience uh, that you have shared uh, with us, Dalita. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And right, as you said, you know, like uh, uh, sometimes... When we face some difficult situations, we feel that we are uh, knocked down. We lose hope. And we would be surrounded by things. We would be confused with lots of emotions. We don't even understand where we are. And at that moment, we have to hear, listen to the calling of our heart. It keeps telling us, hello, hello, hello. Listen, you are just knocked down. You are not knocked out. The challenge is 
not to destroy you the challenge is to define you so get up wake up hit it back and you would redefine yourself you would revive yourself you will re rebuild yourself and that brings me a beautiful experience from renu narayan today renu narayan believes stories empower change she is a nature lover she is a pet lover and founder of katha vriksh the beautiful part is renu loves to write her own stories and share her own stories renu the screen is all yours thank you so much roini with a very kind introduction i want to take you all back to the year 2014 it was december 2nd i was going to the pages of the newspaper and suddenly half the paper there was an advertisement i read through it it was for the annual chennai marathon organized by dream runners now it had been a long time on my wish list i must participate in a marathon but till date i had not had the courage but this time without even giving myself a moment to think i went online filled up the registration form and paid up the registration charges i thought to myself after all i walk 5 kilometers every day what is 10 kilometers and i have nearly 2 months to practice i'm sure i can do this i was reassuring myself from inside the very next day i decided the run was slated for the 26th of january and this was december 2nd so i thought why not start immediately the marathon was for 10 kilometers half a marathon full marathon half and full were definitely not in my scope but 10 kilometers very doable so the very next day i started off on a brisk walk area where i walk is a beautiful well laid out colony with broad tree lined avenues all lying parallel to one another so you don't have to walk up and down the same road again and again all i did was i would walk down one road then go down another then another then another and the last road would lead up to the beach i would go up to the water's edge see the sunrise utter a few shlokas and then retrace my steps to go back home and this was about 5 kilometers so the next day what i did was i started off on a brisk walk and then i started to run and as soon as i started feeling a bit breathless i stopped again walked i continued this till i reached the beach and then back home i felt quite proud of myself i was able to run not for very long perhaps but enough to give me the feeling that i can do this so the next few days this was the routine i followed and by the end of 10 days I was able to run continuously for two kilometers without stopping to walk. That was a great, great achievement for me. I thought to myself, "I can do this. I will do this." December fifteen, my older daughter came back home from Bangalore. The college had closed earlier, and she was there for a long winter break. Now they had been wanting to go on a trip somewhere. My husband was away sailing, so what I did was I hired a car and a chauffeur, <coughs> and the three of us. <clears throat> we went on a road trip down south tamil nadu visited some nice beautiful places some temples and came back on the 23rd so it was about a 10 day trip also i was all the time thinking to myself oh my god i'm missing out on my training time but i was also having fun with my daughters at first they were saying no these are places are boring but they thoroughly enjoyed it all of us did it was exhausting but we liked it so the 23rd night we reached Next morning, as usual, I was up by five o'clock. I asked Mel, "My sir, should I go for a walk?" Something inside was telling me, "Don't go." But I shrugged this off as sheer laziness. Ten days of not walking, perhaps I didn't want to walk. I have to go because I have this marathon to run. So I came out on a brisk walk, started running, walking, running, and as I turned into third row, a few houses away. I saw two watchmen bringing out three big dogs, and I slowed down to a walk. I have seen these dogs pretty often, and I knew they're not friendly. I didn't want to get them excited to see me running past them. Then all of a sudden, one of them broke free from the watchman and came charging towards me. It was the same Bernard. I don't know how many of you are familiar with various breeds. 
St. Bernard's are huge dogs. They're generally very friendly. But this one didn't look friendly at all. And he was really running very fast. I had nowhere to go. I turned around. I thought, where can I escape? Where can I go? But not a soul in sight, except for those two watchmen. And nowhere to go. All the gates were shut. Where do I go? And by that time, he had already pushed me hard down on the ground. I put my hands out, fell hard on my hands and my knees. And then he started to bite me on my left button. I screamed for help. Help, help, somebody help. But the two watchmen are still standing there like statues. Finally, after seeming like neons to me, one of them came and dragged the dog away. By then I was bleeding on my palms, on my knees. I closed a tone at the back. It was hurting. No one came to help me get me out. Somehow, I lay that dazed for a minute. And then I got up. I limped across to them and I said, go and leave those dogs inside immediately. They're still standing there like statues holding the dogs. They took the dogs inside. Then when they came back, I said, go and call the owners immediately. Now these guys were from up north, so I spoke in Hindi. Abhi, abhi, bula kila. Bring them out immediately, yes. One of them went inside very slowly, came back again slowly and said, sorry, madam. I ain't any, both busy. I said, what busy? Tell them now. They have to come right now. Otherwise, I'm going to barge it. But I was scared of the dogs. So finally, the husband and wife came. In the meantime, I had already called my neighbors. Two of them turned up. My husband was away sailing. So I had no one else who turned. Husband and wife came out and said, what happened? I said, this is what your dog did. And I turned around and showed and said, this is what your dog has done. You know, surprisingly, they were not at all apologetic. They didn't look sad or sorry for me. I would have, first thing I would have done if one of my dogs had attacked somebody, would be <clears throat> go forward, hold that person and say, I'm really, really sorry. Please come inside. The woman did say, I'm a doctor. You can come inside and wash your hands and your knees. That's all she said. I said, sorry, I'm not coming inside your house. You took your own sweet time to come outside. Please arrange a car and driver for me. I need to go to the hospital to get an IV baby shot. Oh, don't worry about it. My our dogs are vaccinated. I said, I don't care. I want to get an IV baby shot. And you please arrange for a car and driver. I'll go home first, have a bath, then I need to go to the hospital. So then finally, reluctantly, they arranged for a car. My neighbors also came with me. I could hardly sit, so I had to sit in a lopsided kind of manner. Went home, had a quick bath, washed all the areas properly. And then I woke up my children. I told them, I'm going to the hospital. Don't worry. I'll be back very soon. So I went to Muller Hospital. On the way, I called up my neurologist. He was practicing there. And since I have this epileptic fits every now and then, I just recovered one from that same year in October, in September. So I called him up and asked him, can I take an antibiotic injection since I'm on all these medications? And he said, yes, yes, please go ahead. Take the injection. So I went to the casualty. And there the doctor, you know, he was so shocked when he saw the extent of the injuries. He said, what? What kind of a dog is this that bit you? I said, it was a St. Bernard. He said, my God, I have to give you human immunoglobin injections all over. I'm sorry, but I have to give you eight injections. So he gave me eight injections around the same area. Then he gave me the anti rabies shot. I applied a thick plaster and said, please don't get this area wet. I nodded and then we went back home. I told the driver, please come back. I need four more shots. And I told him the dates. Second and third shot went off. When I had to go for the fourth shot, I discovered that there was a cyst growing under my right arm. And that had grown considerably in size and was extremely painful. Where the dog had bitten me on my back was also very badly swollen. You know, it was really like a tight, small, dickish lump on my backside. So I went, I called up the hospital, fixed up an appointment with the lady surgeon, went and saw her. I showed her the cyst. She said, I'm sorry, madam, but you have to remove this immediately because it's highly infected. I said, she said, when can I schedule it? I said, can you do it now? She said, yes. So I said, please go ahead. So she cut it out, stitched it up. And then I went to another surgeon, showed him my backside and said, see, this is hard lump is there. What do I do? He said, you keep watching it. We'll wait, wait and watch. In case if something has to be done, we'll have to surgically remove it. This was excellent news for me. How fantastic. I was looking forward to a marathon. And here I'm being told that this damn thing would also need surgery.
sorry for the language. So I went back home feeling very crestfallen. But luckily for me, in the next few days, the lump had sort of started reducing in size. After nearly 10 days of not having walked, I finally went back to working. I couldn't run, so I walked. And I'd also called up that, those, that couple and told them, never ever bring your dogs out from this time to this time. They had the gall to tell me, you don't come walking on that road at that time. Don't come on our road at all. I said, the road doesn't belong to you. It belongs to everybody. So you keep your dogs inside. If you don't have a garden big enough, too bad. Keep your dogs inside. So, so some 5.30 to 7 o'clock or so, I've given them the time slot and they kept the dogs inside. So I continued practicing my this five kilometer thing, you know, in the beginning it was only walking, then running, walking. It was already January 12th and I had very little time to practice. Finally, I told myself, now I have to start running. So I started running. Then it became two kilometers again, I was able to run. Then I found I have to go on one straight 10 kilometer distance. I cannot do this five kilometers up and down twice. So what I did, I went on the main road. Now, the main road is very risky because there are pond buses going to Pondicherry at full speed. There are cars going at full speed. And some, sometimes, you know, they act smart when they see a woman walking alone. They try to scare you. I knew all of that. But still, I thought, I have to do this. So, I started walking and running up to 10 kilometers then 10 kilometers back. Because I can't just do one side 10 kilometers and then not do the other. So, I was actually doing 20 kilometers. I was running, walking, running, walking, running, walking. And I was able to run 2-3 kilometers at a stretch almost four kilometers then the day of the say two days before the event i called one of my friends asked her for a what kind of shoes i needed so she mentioned a very good pair of running shoes that was the only thing i bought then on the day of the run luckily my this in this uh, cyst had healed even on my backside much of it had healed i was able to sit comfortably in my car i drove myself to the venue picked up my bib with my number and the t-shirt and everything, wore it all on. And then when the signal went off, I was off. It was a smart click. I went running, 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 running. Then I had to stop. I drank some water, walked a little, ran again, walked a little, ran again. Every time the camera was there, they would tell me, Madam, Madam, run, run. So I would run. And then I kept running, running, running. Finally, I reached the venue again in 90 minutes. And I think when I reached the venue, I was so thrilled with myself. I thought I was down, but I wasn't out. I'm sharing the story with you because I want all of you to know that no matter what happens, we need to get back to being who we are. I wanted to run in that marathon and I did it. Thank you. That was so deep and so profound and I am really like uh, feeling, could feel the pain that you went through, but your grit and your determination that drove you is like, my God. In 2022, when I had a thyroid nodule surgery also, it was growing, that lump was growing. So though it wasn't malignant, doctor said like, as I was nearing 40s, it has to be removed. And uh, they also said there might be a problem with the vocal cords after that. And that was the scariest part because my entire life is talking, 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 singing and talking. And if I lose it, there is no, there. you know, it's totally, I, I say I'm knocked out of my life. And um, after it was, you know, it took a lot of time for me to get back. And when I was trying to sing also, I was unable to raise my pitch. So I was feeling very low and, you know, it was my friends who helped me out my family who helped me out and I can completely, you know, relate to what you were going through that moment, Reno. And the story is so profound. My life hits us, but we will rise. We will rise from the ashes again. Phoenix birds. And all these are, you know, uh, these are all different phases or different stages in life. And at every stage or at every point, we have to revisit our personas or we have to revisit our thinking patterns or thought processes and learn sometimes, unlearn sometimes, take some things, leave some things, let go of some things. And that is all life is about. So we have a wonderful experience to be shared by Shri Karuna now, the stage of life. 
and shrikarna she is a storyteller an nlp practitioner mindfulness and a happiness coach founder of chandamama kada in the moonlight of stories and she believes that stories have the power to heal and spread happiness shrikarna the screen is all yours unmute yourself shri my voice is clear am i audible yes yes shri fine okay thank you so much for the lovely introduction and uh, yes so the title of my story is on the stage of life and before i begin my story i want to quote william shakespeare all the worlds a stage and all the men and women merely players they have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts his acts being seven ages so right from i think i was in first grade i was chosen to be on the stage without my intention or without my inclination the first time they chose me to be on the stage in st mary school in a small town in andhra pradesh was because i was very very chubby with lots of chubby cheeks and that play was about all the good food nutrient food and everybody were dressed in greens or i was dressed to represent milk and because it was st mary's the sisters you know that white lace gown they put on me they put a white uh, wheel and they gave me a milk bottle and i always loved to drink milk maybe i was in the upper kindergarten or grade 1 exactly don't remember i have the childhood picture and that was the first time i was on stage later fourth fifth sixth grade in bangalore and then i moved on to nasik in a township and being part of the telugu community we had sankranti celebrations even in the school allocation competition and i was in yellow house i loved dramatics and i used to participate and once um i got best actress award and the play was the monkey's paw and i still remember having that small glycerin bottle from the medical shop and putting the glycerin and crying my heart out and all the uh, eyeliner on my face and oh my god and for another play my nice frock i had patches of uh, uh, small this one to show that i was wearing a tattered frock with patches here and there a very poor me poor little girl kind but i did not know that girl that teenage girl today would be standing on the stage in front of so many people and would be narrating stories and they will be hearing to her mesmerized but between all this there was one day when i was on a particular stage and that is the most memorable day of my life to be on a stage it so happened I got married early and i was moving places wherever my husband was moving finished my graduation and was doing whatever i could uh with all kinds of diplomas this that and the last transition was from indore to a remote town near vizag which is called vijayanagar and just before indore it was mumbai where i worked in various organizations and in indore i worked in aptech the computer education when i was in mumbai i had finished my uh college in bsc with science but i had this inclination to do my mba why because my father he is a post graduation in tool design whom i looked up to as a role model for me and working in hindustan motors in indore he used to attend workshops in iim and ahmedabad and xlri and he used to come back and discuss the various case studies and what all he heard in the seminars there and i used to aspire to do this mba and in mumbai i wanted to do mba in mims narsi monji or jemna lal bajaj but at that time now i think i chuckle i was 25 already oh my god 
all the other aspirants will be other students will be just 21 22 out of their graduation on is it isn't 25 too late to do my mba i can't go to college now was my thought process anyways we got transferred from mumbai and my husband was in busawal i had to move to indore i started working and finally i was in the small town and i was looked upon like an alien i don't know why because i didn't dress up in skimpy clothes or jeans pants and t-shirts i was always like this with kurtis and salwars and all but still the other women wore sarees they applied a lot of turmeric on their face and they were very very religious still i used to try to make conversation with them what did you cook today which school your children are going and which grade are they in shall i help them in their studies and i tried my best but i don't know whether it is my language the dialect i spoke telugu something some barrier was there that they looked at me like oh she's a city bred girl kind of look. and i was desperate to make friends i didn't have any friends and i didn't have anything to do i was losing it day by day day by day day by day i was going into depression and then when small paper ad comes wanted counselors for NIIT that is another prominent one other than aptic in education computer education okay i have this aptic and arena experience i'll go and apply and i applied and immediately i was selected i was going there but still not having any friends in that small town nobody to talk to my husband with his busy schedule in the railways i was not happy I was not this cheerful, bubbly, effervescent girl that I always was. One colleague of mine saw he. I got introduced to him. He was in teaching. I was in marketing and counselling, and he came up to me and said, "You're smiling, but your smile is not reaching your eyes. Are you happy?" I was like, "Oh my God!" And then he got me the book, "Stop Worrying and Start Living." I just read two chapters of that book, and then I went and spoke to my bosses. I'm just not happy, only sitting there, you know, like a decoration and explaining the courses to some people. Give me more work. I started taking up quality management classes. I loved being in front of people and speaking, and the quality management was speaking to someone inside me. You are meant for this. and then i saw the ad in the paper it was for mba the first batch from andhra university vizag i applied the entrance was due and it was through distance mode with some classes in the university my mother comes from mangalore and she's so fond of telugu movies those days the amazon everything was not there so whenever she came from indore i had to show her lots of telugu movies she was fond of movies i took her to relatives houses here there everywhere and the days just passed by in a whirlwind and finally it was just two three days for the entrance i was cramming the book all mental ability this that everything and i reach the venue once upon a time i had given hotel management entrance and since then i felt i got selected for that entrance too that is another story for another day so For me, I thought yellow is my lucky color. I wore my yellow dress and went, and everywhere there are people. Oh my God, so many people! Will I able to qualify? There is a reservation for women. Maybe I would. And I gave my entrance and came back. Those days there was no internet. This is I'm talking about 99. There was internet, but the results were not out on internet. And then uh, we had gone out to attend a wedding and came back. And I was waiting in the station. My husband said, "You wait here. I'll send people to carry the luggage because my grandmother used to give lots of things for the only granddaughter that was me, all pickles and everything." And he sent someone with all the luggage. I reached home, which was just adjacent to the railway station. Once I entered the home, he said, uh, "Your result hall ticket is here. I mean, your result uh, card is here." I said, "What is my rank?" He said, "Guess." I said, "Is it within thousand?" I thought. At least three hundred seats might be there with thirty percent reservation for women. I will qualify. He said no. More or less. I said within eight hundred. He said no. More or less. Within five hundred. No. More or less. Within three hundred. No. 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 More or less. Within hundred. He said okay. Wait. 
you got the 15th rank <gasps> my god i didn't prepare so well and i got the 15th rank it was so unbelievable and he said he hugged me and said i'm so proud of you i'm really really proud of you all your potential is being wasted you know by moving place to place with me go do your thing and the day of the admission scheme i dressed up in peach colored lucknow sari starched well kept he said do you want me to come but his job was so important i said no i'm independent i can go i can go alone but after going there that day i realized i wish he was there next to me to see how proud he would have been they wanted to start the admissions with the female candidates and among all the female candidates it was me the 15th rank holder who was the first one so they call my name upon the stage and i walked goosebumps i wished my parents were there i wished my husband was there and when i walked upon the stage and they gave me the first admission letter and i felt so proud that day on the stage and till date my role number is 001 dm andhra university distance mod mba and i have the uh, id card even till today and now as an anchor when i hosted it industry conference in vizag that also just came to me just like that when i am on the stage in front of the mic talking to people i remember that day that moment and take a deep breath yes this is a stage of life people keep changing but what is a new comes out beautifully thank you see i was just smiling smiling and all smiling no, to watch your story are you able to hear me Oh, yes I, maybe yeah. my my network yeah. is a little yeah i'm just smiling and smiling and smiling throughout your story that was so sweet and so wonderful it is so fascinating to hear such journeys and you know somewhere or the other we just you know our mind goes into our database and retrieves that is existing somewhere down your memory lane sri can you hear us okay fine when i was uh, when i completed my 10th board examinations uh, i just wanted to give uh, an entrance examination ap residential junior college that was where my father has done his uh, plus 1 and plus 2 i was also i also wanted to do my uh, intermediate from there so i just went and sat and uh, in the examination hall the the subjects were maths uh, english and social studies because my stream was maths economics and commerce so as i went i completed my maths exam i completed my english exam and it was post lunch the social studies exam so as i was entering into the hall my father said your re results could be released soon i just went sat and was writing my entire mind was on my results i just wrote half of the paper just then a lady entered the room and said who is rohini here i just looked back and you know raised my hand she said uh, you know you have cleared you have cleared your 10th board you know with flying colors that is what your father <laughs> asked me to, to tell you i left my social studies answer paper there gave it to the english letter and ran off <laughs> out of 75 in each subjects maths i scored 72 english i scored 70 and 20 marks in social studies where i could not get a seat in residential college that was a beautiful experience and sometimes i scold my father for that but luckily anyway i studied in another private corporate college and when the results were released again for my inter first year i just got a call i lifted the phone and it was my principal he said congratulations rohini you stood first in the state and i was totally on cloud line that made that made so it's wonderful to listen to such experiences and all always and it is so overwhelming to listen to the stories again which you all have shared each one of you had shared a unique experiences 
when it is with lalita it is you know how she has handled the situation that has been faced by her daughter if it is with renu it is like how she has handled a tougher situation she went through lot of pain but she still stood up and fought with them and got the things done and could in fact you know complete that race and with preeti again a maid of honor a such a common woman with lot of grit a lot of determination to do something in life and supporting the family at that level is completely amazing and veena ji like it is a soft lullaby kind of story have you have you established connections with people and that we generally see every day whenever we associate with you whenever we feel low we just call you and we get that warmth and that affection from you always and shri has also shared a beautiful experience i don't know she got the disconnected or is she here yes i'm here i'm here yeah yeah, yeah. fine fine shri so all such wonderful experiences put together made a beautiful crush it i can say so anybody would like to share anything uh right from the idea of narrating personal stories rohini um and the choice of stories i always believe the universe brings in the best people together and ideas together and all so uh from the time the title fish shared on the whatsapp i was so looking forward you know preeti's title the maid of honor and the bridging intergeneration this and then they knew all the titles were so intriguing and i was so looking forward and when preeti shared the story of her maid mallika true we we get inspired for, by so many of whether it's maids or the washerwoman or the laundry woman or somebody who gets a milk packet they they, they all do such amazing uh, lives they live and all that and yes. when renu title when she said knocked down but not not out i was thinking it like recently she took a a sabbatical from her story telling and then she's bouncing back i thought she's going to share this particular you know she's bouncing back that story <laughs> and then <laughs> she completely surprised me with even with her, even, yeah. even she knocked me out knocked me down with this <laughs> i know i just could see her i could visualize her standing there and arguing with that man no you get the vehicle and i want to take all her heroism there and uh, oh amazing it was and veena ji i just could pick a uh, picture of all those little girls in your community coming to you asking you to tell a story and you asking them about their exam then lalita i just can relate so well with yours because my elder one to experience things of this kind but uh, that guy was coming on a scooter near her school bus and my husband went and did the same thing and so me he dealt with it she came and shared it with me but he said you stay here i'm going to go and deal similar stories you know <laughs> and that guy used to literally follow her school bus every day <laughs> to the school and my god Oh my God! These people that really scare us. I could so relate with you. Yes. How yes. the mother feels and all that. Yeah, so yeah. all the stories, each and every one, as you say, it's beautiful crochet. All the colors come together to make a beautiful pattern. So different emotions and uh, yeah. So whenever I feel low, I'm I'm not doing good enough. Oh my God! What is this? I mean, like I I change so many professions and all that, but. whenever i feel low and whenever i feel i'm not doing good enough i just remember that day that stage moment and you no know, yes. <laughs> yes. i'm i'm good i'm up there on the stage yeah so that is so I, in each each of our lives we have achieved whether uh, i mean some of us are sharing on social media i see preeti's and rohini's wins and you know storytelling competitions and all that and uh, rohini has caring about your principle saying that you have stood fast and all this it's not this but there are so many moments in our lives we feel worthy about and the moment we feel we're not good enough or we're not uh when we just go back and remember that moment those moments when you know, when we were all applauded and appreciated and when we felt so good about ourselves that re-energizes us and gives us that, that gratitude get back into it again If we did it then, we can do it now. Yes, yeah. that is so beautiful, Sri. Lovely. 
Yes, Renu, Veena ji, Lalita and Preeti, you have something to yeah. share? I just want to say that I also identify being a mother of two daughters. I have also fought battles, not for them, in the sense that when somebody is staring, you know, I tell them, what are you staring at? In fact, there was an incident <laughs> in a clinic once and this guy kept on staring because three of us were sitting opposite him. So I told him, why don't you look up? So he looked up <laughs> and there was a statue of Ganesha there. So I said, again, he was staring at him. He said, why don't you look up? Again, he looked up. He was <laughs> not really listening to me. I said, look up. He looked up again. I said, why are you looking at us? Bhagavan with the red, with the dick. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you look forward. Then he started talking to the receptionist and he stopped looking at us. Both my daughters are very embarrassed. But I said, I'm not going to allow this nonsense. That he has no right to keep. And that you're looking up and down, up and down to your us. I said, what the hell? And I had a even more uh, uh, better story to narrate for this one. Then I thought, okay, what if there are children in this? And I was physically molested. I wanted to talk about it. And I said, no, what if there are children also listening to this? So it's not such a nice topic. So I, I chose this one instead. Mm. So knowing you know that you have daughters, you always have to worry when, when yes. our children are going out. But I told my children, you know, you should just scream. When you scream and you get attention, other people will come. And then the person, generally these boys are cowards, you know. It's just yes, that yes. you think that because they've been brought up in a society saying that you, know, you can do whatever you want and you get yeah. it. From the beginning, when I was very young, when I was in college, I used to say, keep the sons in, let the daughters out. Because yes. girls will never harm anybody. They can stay out late, they can do whatever they want, come back home, keep the boys inside the house after six. Or whatever. <laughs> Tie on them, not on the girls. You said we do yes. the opposite. No, you don't go out. Why were you wearing such a dress? She have worn something long or no? This, that, we keep telling them, but that's the situation now. I just tell my daughter, hit anybody and come. If, if you feel uncomfortable, hit them. I'm going yeah, to see what is happening. I'll take the consequences. And she is like that, you know. Very good. Very good. That's if the best way to teach them a lesson. Just hit them and comes home. Mm. Only thing, no, the fear is that they'll take revenge. They might come into us. Ah, only <laughs> those kind of fears are there. Hmm. The situation is like that outside. Yes, Veena ji. I'm happy you made me reflect and write something. That's all I can say. Um, yeah. Writing a story is quite different from narrating a story. Yes. Um, there are many experiences in your head, but when you have to put them down on paper and see the flow, yes. um, it may appeal to you. But you have to look at what the audience wants also, because the audience hears. You hear things in your head. But uh, when you speak, you are speaking to somebody else. And um, you have to make sure, rather, um, that the chord touches them too. That's when you get your audience into your show or into your telling. And I thank all of you uh, for telling wonderful personal stories and being able to touch that chord in maybe the uh, Facebook Live uh, audience too. I'm sure they may, there may be many comments there. Yes. And many more may be inspired to write or pen their own stories. Thank you, Rohini. And thank you, everybody, once again. Thank you so much, Veena. That was beautiful. Yes, Preeti? Yeah, I'm so happy I could narrate a story, you know. Though I hope ki it wasn't totally inaudible in between. I'm no, audible now. Yes, very good. <laughs> Much, Much louder as well. We could hear, I could hear the entire story. I heard the entire story. Oh, 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 thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm glad that, I mean, I could narrate her story somewhere. I guess, I mean, more people like my maid, you know, I mean, as Rohini said, we crib about so many small things in life and these people, they face it every day at a huge level and then still they are so strong and they don't get any kind of appreciation or you know medal or award but still they are doing it and she I guess is the strongest woman I have ever seen actually without an iota of doubt you know because she gets nothing in return if you see so she's doing and she's very sure that her daughter and her daughters-in-law are independent and you know there's no and her grandchildren are educated she knows the value of education it's a great thing really yeah, involuntarily is empowering them. Yeah, yeah, such really. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Piti. Yes, Lalita. Thank you, Rohini. Thank you, everybody. All your stories touched 
uh, my heart and i think we all connected through this forum it was a wonderful yes. experience thank you so much roini for bringing me in thank you my pleasure you know you made this women's day so special and i've been i just uh, uh, you know it's something flashed in my mind i just wanted to do something for women's day let us all meet together and immediately i did not post this anywhere i personally messaged the people i wanted to be on my screen and it's my privilege that all of you said yes and all of thank you, you so much rohini for that thank you so much thanks a lot i'm humbled always with your constant support have been taking you know my steps forward and forward and looking for many other things coming in future with all your cooperation and support and lots of love thanks a lot and thank you to the wonderful audience who have taken the time watching and posting sharing their comments and this is oyi jayati signing off we'll see you back get back to you with another wonderful event till then bye bye bye